Hi guys. Um, still just sitting here recovering on the couch. Feeling much better. I look like hell. Need to go take a shower. But I just wanted to do a video. I wanted to kind of talk about the protocol that I went through when I got admitted. Um, so people have an understanding of kind of like what happens when you go to the emergency room. Uh, if you think you have COVID. Um, so I got admitted. I went, started having breathing problems. Um, there was a whole process that led up to me deciding to go to the emergency room. <clears throat> Anyways, uh, went to the emergency room and my husband dropped me off. And yeah, it's like the whole pandemic tent. People in hazmat suits, um, you can't have anyone go in with you. Obviously, if you're under 18, someone can go in with you. Um, so you hear these horror stories of your kids, you can't be with your kids. Up to a certain point, you can be with your kids. If they're going to admit your child to a COVID ward, yeah, you do get separated. But at that point, you're like, do whatever to keep my child breathing. Um Anyway, so went to the ER, uh, went to the COVID tent, and at that point, when I got admitted right then, I my test had come up positive, so I knew I was positive walking into that tent. They took me straight back um, to one of the four beds, because it's a mass unit in there. It's not pretty. It's overworked doctors and nurses doing what they can and full PP. Um, when I went in, there was about six people and I got pulled ahead of them because I was already known that I was positive because my test had just popped up positive. And uh, <clears throat> they took me straight back to a chest x-ray and did a chest x-ray in the, in the uh, pandemic tent. And then... <clears throat> they waited for the results of that that ended up coming back showing that I started getting what they call the the dry stop Juju's my dogs just barking anyways it showed that I was starting to get what they call um, the COVID pneumonia in my upper right lung and uh, to explain like what it felt for me, because I'm a patient, I'm not a doctor, and everyone's path is going to be different, but <sighs> growing up as a kid, my lungs would stick occasionally, and you get that knife feeling in your lungs, and you have to <gasps> take a deep breath to pop your lungs apart, and then you're like, ah, you know, but there's that whole, oh, you hold your lungs, and you're like, no, 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 no. Some people have had this. I've talked to lots of people. They've had it growing up. Some people have no idea what I'm talking about. <sighs> Your lungs, or at least my lungs with COVID, were like two wet napkins and they would stick. The, the, stop it, stop it. The, um, Sean, can you come get Emma? She's trying to get something down there. Anyway, so, uh, where was I? So hard to focus. Um, no so anyways um it's not at first fluid going into your lungs if you catch it early it's the virus going into your lungs and inflaming it and then your cells lung cells collapse in on each other and make it sticky and you have to pop it like Take a deep breath and fill your whole lungs. Google um, deep breathing exercises. I did not know until this happened that you don't get air until air reaches the bottom of your lungs. That's when it pushes into your bloodstream. So if your lungs are sticking at the top and you're not expanding them, nothing's getting to the bottom, so you're not getting air in your, in your body. And then obviously as your lungs stick more and more together, <sighs> just a second, I need to get a breath. Um, then you can't get air in. And then once your lungs get so inflamed with COVID, oh, Emma, stop. Um, <laughs> dogs. Um, 
Oh my gosh, these dogs are just driving me nuts. Stuck on the couch with two little 10 pound chihuahuas. It's been hard. <laughs> so, but anyways, once your lungs get sticky and they get stickier and stickier, your body tries to flush out what's the irritating. So then it starts pushing water into your lungs and that's when you get real pneumonia, water pneumonia, back, and then bacteria gets in. So then you can get bacterial pneumonia and then ARDS can start in, which is a whole other story. So anyways, I went in and I had it, COVID pneumonia starting in my upper right lung. Um, they did the chest x-ray within like four hours. They had me in the CT scan in the hospital getting a contrast dye. And within four hours, COVID had traveled from my right lung to my left lung. It was in my upper lung. And by the end of my battle over the three days, uh, COVID had reached the bottom of my left lung. Um, I did not get any fluid in uh, my lungs. But uh, so once they they did the chest x-ray in the Quonset hut, MASH unit, um, and then the head of CDC came down and told me, we're admitting you. Um, we need to get you over the hump. It's We caught it early, but we need to get you over the hump and see if we can get you over the hump. And uh, <clears throat> once that was said to me, they started their protocol. And through this whole process, every team of nurses, and I'll explain the teams of nurses maybe on another video, but um, every one of them said, we understand this virus. It, everyone battles it different. It's always different for everyone, but they said, we understand it. And they said at first... What they see most of the time is it hits here. You're getting it here through your mouth, your nose. It's in here. And it loves acid. It loves a certain acid that it uses as a tool to replicate itself with. So <clears throat> then it goes down in into your lungs. And it's rare for people, I don't know, I didn't know this, but it's rare for people to get pneumonia, double pneumonia, to get it in both sides. This gets in both sides. Maybe not always, but it, it travels easily between both lungs. So it went down my esophagus and then went straight sideways into both sides of my lungs. It continues through your digestive tract because it loves this acid that's in your digestive tract. And um, it... It uses that acid to build a twin, to copy itself. So the, from what I understand and talking to many, many nurses through this whole thing and going through this, the story was all the same with every nurse. They understand it. Um, catching it early is key. Not everyone escalates to the breathing issues. They just have the flu issues, but it goes very fast sometimes into other problems. It's always good to get checked out, get checked out. Um, but uh, so the virus enters and its job is to destroy something. It wants to attach to tissue and just wreak havoc in that little spot. And what it does is it makes a little blood clot. So you start getting blood clots and wherever it's attacking, whether it's your lungs, your esophagus, down into your intestines, if it gets in your kidneys, liver, whatever, so they need to keep you on blood thinners. So the first thing I got was shots in my stomach for blood thinner to get my blood thin so that any clots that were throwing from this little bastard that was inside of me um, didn't cause more problems than, than necessary. The next thing they did was instantly give me, they gave me Pepsid, Famotidine, not Omniprazole, not... Tums, it was Pepsid. For some reason, they found Pepsid has helped neutralize the acid that this virus uses to copy itself with. Because the virus's job is to first enter your body, wreak havoc, then reach its arm out, grab a hammer, which we're going to pretend it's grabbing a hammer, but that hammer is that acid, and then that hammer builds a twin. And if they grab, if that acid is neutralized or damaged in some way, 
it reaches and grabs that acid hammer and that hammer turns to like a noodle and the virus instantly commits suicide because it says I don't have a tool to replicate myself. I am going to just kill myself. And that's what the virus does. And you just hope that all the viruses in you are grabbing neutralized acid and don't have the tool to build. And you're hoping that there isn't, that they caught it early enough that there isn't too many viruses that your body can't battle it. Then that way your immune system can step forward and, and, uh, and take over. So my immune system couldn't because it was, I, I'm immune compromised. I have, um, uh, I'm a cardiac patient and so things don't kind of work right in my body sometimes. But, um, anyway, so, um, the next thing they did after they gave me the blood thinner, then they gave me the, um, Pepsid, they give you, um, Maalox, which is a liquid antacid laxative. Um, because they want to coat your digestive tract just to get, cause you start getting burning. And the first thing they said is, do you have burning yet? And I said, I have no burning when I went into the ER. They said, you will trust me. You will. It's like freaking fire. It's like your body's trying to produce this acid to give this tool to this thing and all this inflammation is going on. Um, and so they coated it with Maalox and then they gave me a stool softener because they want to keep your digestive tract shuttling out any dead virus. They just want to keep it moving, keep it moving. They don't want things to sit. Um, and then the last thing that they gave me before they admitted me was uh, a very strong steroid because I, and the CT scan showed I had inflammation everywhere in my body and they needed to calm my body. So it wasn't fighting everywhere so that it could just fight <coughs> the virus that was attacking my lungs at that time. So once they did this whole protocol, this protocol was done over and over and over in the hospital. Um, among other things, I started getting breathing treatments and ox supplemental oxygen. Um, but that was the start of it all. And then they admitted me, uh, head of CDC came down for infectious disease. Dr. Chow came down and said, we're admitting you. Um, and I actually went, I didn't know at the time there's three levels. There's COVID ward one, COVID ward two and COVID ward three. And one is ICU where you get intubated. COVID Ward 2 is where I went, but then I also went to a side panel, which was called Cardiac COVID Ward. Um, cardiac Critical Care Cardiac COVID Ward is what I was in. Because everyone has heart stress when they're not getting air, but I just happen to be a heart patient. So um, I went straight there and was on a wireless cardiac uh, monitor. Um, when you're admitted, you are brought into these negative pressure rooms. You have no one in the room with you. They're watching you with cameras. The nurse, your team of nurses come in and out and I'll do another video on how the nurses handled it. They are absolute pros over and over and over. The nurses told me you're so lucky you got it now and you didn't get it earlier in the year because we understand this disease. We, we know how to fight it somewhat. We know the steps to try to get someone turned around. Um, so the nurses are watching you on cameras. They come in when they can, but you have to understand the biggest and most scariest thing through this whole thing is this is a disease of a virus that stops your air. You do not get air. You're, you could be throwing up, you could have diarrhea, whatever you have, the flu, everyone calls it the flu, the flu, the flu. Um, but when it hits, it's your air that's gone. And your first responder team cannot step forward. When you are panicking and not having air and your oxygen is stopped, your PPE team covered in all their masks and everything, they are not jumping forward. They have to jump backwards first and assess the situation because patients are ripping off their hospital nurses and doctors gear. Um, you're, you're panicking, you have no air. 
so that was the hardest thing for me once I got admitted when I started having the breathing episodes. I had many, many, many episodes, but <clears throat> I had three very large ones, one very large one and two, all of them scary. But, um, but anyways, it, that was my, my first learning curve <laughs> fast and furious on that first big heavy breathing, um, episode when my, my nurses jumped backwards when I had the first thing and I was able to physically expand my lungs on my own. They give you one of these. This is, if you graduate off of this, it's either you're graduating to go home or you're graduating to get intubated. So <laughs> I graduated to go home, but this is a simple little $10 breathing um, exerciser that you suck on and it teaches you to expand your lungs and it helps you expand your lungs. And I lived on this thing for three days, standing next to my bed, sitting up on my bed, never laying down, never sleeping, doing this thing to keep my lungs, my wet napkin lungs popped apart. And then all the medicines they were giving me, and I actually got a very heavy duty antiviral called remdesivir, which not everybody gets. I don't know what their protocol is for giving it to people, but it's not something that's easily obtained. It's very expensive, and they know who it may work for and who may not work for. Luckily, I was able to try it, and uh, it worked for me. But um, this little guy right here, see his little eyes? This is my little breathing elephant. <laughs> this is Bim, he's got a name. Saved my life. Um, I was lucky that I didn't have to graduate to being intubated and that it didn't progress down into my kidneys. I drank a ton of water. The more mobile you are, if, you, if you're able to stand, every room has a bathroom. They want you to drink water, 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 flush your system. And hopefully you can continue doing that if your body holds the water and it goes into your lungs, they have to stop that and start doing a balance of Lasix. And with my bad heart, um, they were worried about me holding onto the water, but <clears throat> I, I, I held my own and it didn't progress that far. Um, anyways, uh, you could buy these online for 10 bucks. It's a good thing. It's a good thing for anyone to just use to exercise your lungs. Start expanding your lungs. Start exercising your lungs. Get one. I don't really even know what they're called. This is called a Vol Voldine 5000. <laughs> but um, I'm glad I graduated out of cardiac care COVID up to the level three. Was there for a couple days after that. <sighs> Got to come home, have lots of stories, lots of things I wish I could unsee. Um, I'll kind of explain on another video how they work their teams within the hospital. It was the most professional. Amazing, amazing care I've ever gotten. And they have it down. They have done this over and over and over. And uh, the biggest problem is they just need it to slow down so they have enough care, care workers to take care of people as they come in. But stay mobile, people. Keep moving. Don't lay down. Sit up in your hospital bed if you can't stand. If you're a, if you're a fall risk, definitely don't stand. Um... Keep putting your hands over your head. Keep doing your breathing exerciser. They tell you at first, every couple hours, <laughs> screw that. Do it like every 15 minutes. No freaking lie. Just do what you can. Don't hyperventilate on it, but you'll know. It has, they teach you on it. Um, they, they didn't really properly teach me until day three. I was doing some things wrong, but like my respiratory therapist said, we didn't care if you were doing it wrong. You were at least doing something. And I was so panicky from the lack of air because I was getting down into the 80s um, for my, my oxygen levels, um, even with supplemental, uh, that I they didn't care as long as I was expanding my lungs. It, it, 
it, they saw me doing what they call recovery, I would drop down and then I would fight, 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 and it would recover and come back. Um, and I would get back up into the low 90s. So um, over and over and over, I would fight to get back into the 90s. On, but uh, I'm just, I'm just glad that I'm home, and I hope that my experience can kind of help other people. Don't be afraid about going to the ER. Get there early. Get there early. Get there early. I got there. There were six people. I got pulled in by the within like an hour. There was a hundred and twenty people behind me. 120 people fighting to breathe people. Just 120 patients coming in with fever, chills, saying they can't catch their breath. It's no joke. It's no joke. Billions of people, well, I don't know about numbers, but tons of people don't aren't going to even have any symptoms. My husband had not a single symptom. Not one single symptom, and he popped up positive the same time I did. He just happened to take the test because I was going to get one, and I said, you might get one. You might as well get one. And uh, and then many stopped, Gigi. Um, many people just get a runny nose. There were people in there that just had runny noses, and they were just getting checked. And... Uh, there were also people coming in that thought they had it and their COVID test came back negative, you know, so, but just get checked, go to the ER. That's what they're there for. Don't wait too long. Um, watch out for your neighbors. Um, you know, it's really sad to say, but the majority of the people in that emergency room with me were of brown color. I just, I'm not saying that lightly it's just um hispanic is, and blacks for some reason the nurses are saying it's hitting that genetic code harder and then if you have a comorbidity behind it like diabetes then it hits even harder so they don't know why but they're definitely seeing a trend the nurses say we're seeing a trend of blacks and hispanics um, also older people, a lot of older people who are not mobile that are, that are, you know, 70, 80, 90, not able to walk around and they sit on their couch a lot and they lay and take naps a lot and they're, they're homesick and they're not the me, me, me generation. They might be sick for a week before they finally just kind of think, oh, maybe I should go to the doctor because they're just so used to just being quiet and, and passive. Um, so quite a few of them were older people that had been just hanging out at home sick for a while who probably should have been in four or five days sooner. Um, and then there's weird people like me, the little one-offs that I'm in my fifties. Um, yeah, I'm a heart patient. Um, but I was relatively in good health when I got this and, um, you know, you just never know. Uh, you know, once again, I'm not a doctor. I'm just explaining what happened with me. Everyone's path is different. Um, hope hope you don't get this. I mean, all the nurses, basically nurses and doctors say, everyone's going to get this. It's everywhere. They're just trying to slow it down so they have time to deal with it. So, uh, you know, I'll do another video of all my conversations with the nurses about um, the vaccines. Um don't be afraid of the vaccine. It's it's goes after one single cell. It's not like a flu flu shot where they put a ton of DNA and and uh, stuff in it to chase four down down four flu viruses that they're guessing on. The vaccine for COVID is that gonna target one single cell, and it's a dead vaccine. So I'm going to be interested to see how it plays out with the vaccine because um, all the nurses say it's going to be probably probably going to be one of the safest vaccines we've seen in a long, long time. Wash your hands, people. Stay safe. This thing's real. Yes, it's a flu, but it's a flu of losing your goddamn air. So when it gets you, it's your air that's disappearing. Um, stay home, wash your hands, do what you can so our first responders are not overworked. Later.